Former Florida State University football player Travis Rudolph is now facing charges of first degree murder and attempted murder. Murder begins when self-defense ends. Now that was a simple sentence said many, many years ago, but that simple sentence perfectly encapsulates why this defendant right there, Travis Rudolph, is sitting in the chair that he's sitting in. The four men arrived when Rudolph's girlfriend contacted them, claiming Rudolph had assaulted her after she found texts from other women on his phone, telling them to come shoot up the house. They were four men who went there to retaliate and kill, just as they were ordered to do. And two of the men did apparently have weapons. Testimony in this case will continue throughout the week. For the past six years, man, the life of Travis Rudolph has been a crazy roller coaster of dramatic highs and lows. Bro, he made the NFL, got cut from the NFL, then was in a shootout which put him on trial for murder. Just last week, he was acquitted of all charges. Again, it's been a crazy six years for this dude. In today's video, I want to talk about those years. But you know, I got to go back before that to give y'all some background. Bro, the way his story starts, it'd be impossible to predict the tragic twists and turns it ends up taking. Let's jump in. So Travis was raised by both his parents in West Palm Beach, Florida. A well-rounded kid, he was described as a mama's boy. But then around the age of 11, he would fall in love with sports. So at that point, man, he started spending hours in the backyard playing catch with his dad, a skill that would soon pay his way through college. According to his high school coach, he wasn't going to blow you away athletically, but his work ethic and drive made him elite on that level. As a kid, people would see him running wind sprints around the block. He felt if he wasn't going to be the fastest, he could at least be the best conditioned. Despite being a mama's boy, he got his mentality from his dad, as they became extremely close during Travis's teenage years. So Travis earns a scholarship and he goes off to college having been raised well in a two-parent household he also had his older cousin to look up to you might have heard of him his name is Devin Hester and he's the greatest return man ever Travis was also close with another Florida-born player. They were both five-star recruits coming out of South Florida. In 2014, Dalvin Cook enrolled at Florida State. Then a few months later, Travis Rudolph enrolled there as well. The two friends immediately moved in together into an off-campus apartment they shared for their entire tenure. Travis had a good background and some great connections within football circles. He was on the right path. As a true freshman, he caught 38 passes for 555 yards and four touchdowns. As a sophomore, he led the team in all major receiving categories with 59 receptions, 916 yards, and he caught seven touchdowns in his best college season. That same year in the Peach Bowl, he went for 200 yards on seven receptions, which broke the school record for the most receiving yards by any Florida State receiver in a ball game showing up in the big moments. That offseason, Florida State visited a Tallahassee middle school. Most of the players found themselves surrounded by large groups of kids, but Travis gravitated towards one specific kid. Bo Paskey was one of the students at the middle school. Bo's autistic, and every day he ate lunch by himself, and Travis had the empathy and the emotional intelligence to see that and go over and sit down with the kid, had a slice of pizza with him, and just showed the dude some kindness. Bo's mom dropped a post explaining and how much it meant to him and how much it meant to her as her son had had social difficulties navigating middle school and had trouble making friends but for Bo this was a moment dude would never forget so that's what's up this video is gonna get a whole lot darker in just a sec one of the few moments of light in this whole damn video I also think it might kind of give us a true glimpse at Travis on a human level at a time his life was going good in my opinion, there's two times where you see who a person really is. When times are going terrible and when times are going great. Because when you up, you don't need nobody. So how you treat people then, when they can't do nothing for you, that means something to me. When you down on your luck and you keep pushing through and don't fold, that's the other situation that mean a lot to me as well. But anyway, his third and final season in college, that's where we left off. He put up similar numbers to the year before and made second team all ACC. Both Travis and Dalvin decided to forego their senior seasons, opting to leave florida state together after three years a lot of friendships start to fall apart when you are around each other too much but dalvin and travis got close man and basically became brothers they had push-up contests and went at each other constantly in madden 
but the real test of their brotherhood wasn't during them happy times. During one of their last nights at their Florida apartment, Dalvin Cook's parents had come up to visit. Now the two ball players' lives was getting ready to change forever, as the NFL draft was only about a week away. But as they sat and reminisced, Dalvin's grandma's phone rings. But on the phone is Travis's mom. Like, why she ain't called Travis? They talked every day, by the way, you know what I'm saying? So it was weird. But even weirder, Travis's mom asked to speak to doubt but grandma misunderstands so she just gives the phone to travis it's his mom she probably assumed he hadn't answered his phone or something but travis's mom's voice is cracking and she can't bear to tell her son over the phone and want somebody to break it to him in person someone she trusts to be there in this moment for her son so with her voice cracking she asks her son to put dalvin on the phone seconds later dalvin takes travis out for a walk and he breaks the saddest most random news you can imagine Travis's dad had been shot and he was in critical condition and the doctors thought that he might not even be able to make it through the night. It ain't like he was in the streets. He was a hardworking, honest man and the way he got shot is some heartbreaking bullshit. The other day I posted that I had to wipe a couple of tears while writing this script but I hadn't even made it to the main story. This is the part I was talking about. It caught me completely off guard and it messed me up for a minute. So Travis's dad owned a landscaping and maintenance company and a strip club called Sugar Daddies needed some work done on their AC. So Travis's dad was working in a back storage room when a worker at the club who was in an adjacent room decides for whatever reason that he needs to move his rifle off the shelf. Bro he acts accidentally discharges the rifle and the bullet of course travels through the wall travis's dad is in there just working on an ac and get hit in the neck with a random ass bullet that's why travis's mom was so shook up she could barely even talk and dalvin cook had to break the news to him and travis broke down in his arms the next day when travis is finally able to get a flight back home and he gets to the hospital to find his dad still being kept alive but he's paralyzed from the neck down he's in pain and he's suffering so they're gonna have to pull the plug travis has to help make this decision but when they actually go through with it i think that's when it really hit him because they say you cried and ran out the room so that took place in april of 2017 and it's the beginning of that crazy six years i spoke about it's not a lot of ups in this thing and this was probably the lowest but being charged with murders probably in the same ballpark but in April of 2017, Travis Rudolph lost his dad in the worst way imaginable. And the NFL draft was the same damn week. Travis and his family cheered with pride when his childhood friend and college roommate, Dalvin Cook, was selected in the second round of the draft. Remember the kid, Bo Paskey? Well, his mom brought him up to the draft party, but unfortunately, it wasn't joyous as it could have been. See, Travis's dad was a huge sports fanatic. He watched the draft every year, cheering loudest for the Florida boys, and he dreamed of the day his son's name would pop up on the screen. So going into the draft process without him, it was a hard thing for the family to deal with. On top of that, Travis is sitting here watching receiver after receiver get drafted, and when it ended, his name was never called. So he ends up signing with the Giants as an undrafted free agent. So much for NFL millions, he got 20,000 guaranteed. After spending time on the practice squad, a string of injuries got him promoted to the active roster and in week seven, he caught his first NFL pass. He actually caught three passes for 32 total yards, nothing crazy, but a big milestone for a player in his situation. So he lost his dad and went undrafted, but he did make it to the league. Now he's catching his first NFL pass all in just a few months he remains on the active roster for the remainder of the season next we got a list of unfortunate events the next year the giants release him he's picked up by the dolphins on the first day of practice he tears his acl that was in 2018 he sits out of ball till 2020 as he had to rehab and then regenerate interest finally in january of 2020 he finally lands on another team when he joins the cfl you know what happens next? Oh, the CFL cancels the season. Remember, this is 2020, global pandemic. So you finally get on the team, but now your league's not having a season. Then in 2021, he's released from his contract. Why was he released? Well, they had a decent reason. He was released the same day he was charged with murder. On April 7, 2021, Travis Rudolph was arrested and charged with first degree murder and three counts of attempted murder.
So, Travis was dating a woman by the name of Dominique, and she was at his home in Florida when the two got into an argument. Apparently, she found some text messages in his phone from another girl that he was messing with, and she was upset. The details of their relationship status is all over the place. Travis said she wasn't his girlfriend, while she insists she was. She did admit that for a while, things hadn't really been the same between them. Now, it's also been said that she was married at the time when she was dealing with Travis, and I have no idea which parts are true but it's fair to say that at this point the relationship had deteriorated they was in relationship purgatory waiting to break up and they wasn't married so it's not that relevant to the overall story so anyway she calls the other girl on FaceTime. Into that conversation, she throws his phone and breaks it. He says she then threw a metal trophy at his head, while she says she picked the trophy up but never threw it. So she storms through the house. She finds his PlayStation and breaks it. She just picked it up and slammed it as the fight basically continues. They both seem to agree that Travis never struck her, and the part of the fight caught on the doorbell camera shows that she was the one throwing hands. She says that something blocked the camera, but Travis picked her up and slammed her, he said all he did was restrain her but at one point she did fall down this is opinion growing up i've seen situations like this where a dude's girl is upset and she's trying to fight he's trying to hold her back or push her off and just protect his face but she coming at him hard as she can and he gotta use a little force to get her off i obviously don't know for sure if that was the case in this situation but from everything we can see and everything we've heard in the whole situation i honestly do believe that that's the most likely scenario it's a big breakup fight between a man and a woman man doesn't get physical with her so if it stops here it's a non-story but they both angrily scream hurtful things at one another and if you've ever seen or been a part of a bad breakup then you know that's pretty much how it goes down i'd imagine it's not a moment you look back and feel proud of but you definitely been through it or know somebody who has so dominique finally leaves bro and this should have been the end of it but she makes one additional move that turns out tragic for everybody involved she angrily sends a text message that incites the real situation when she texts her brother a message saying please go shoot his shit up now Travis testified that she verbally made that same threat, screaming as she drove off that her brother Nim was coming to kill him. She later claims that she just sent the text out of anger and she really didn't mean it, but that right there is a terrible defense. I know I told him to come kill you, but I really didn't mean it. What did she expect her brother Nim to do in this situation? She never texted back and said, yo, I was just angry. Don't go over there. I was tripping when I said that. Leave it alone. We're done. I don't want it to go any further. But she had hours after the first text to send a follow-up to clarify the statement that she later said she didn't mean. But she never clears it up probably because she meant it and her brother Nim actually tried to carry this thing out now if i was travis i wouldn't have antagonized her when she was leaving he told her she was just mad because the other girl he was talking to was better looking than she was and had a better body and they was exchanging hurtful comments but you know he ain't had to say that despite that it don't change the fact that she sent the hit squad to his house and they say they didn't want no trouble but i think that's some bullshit so if you break up with a girl, she say her brother coming to kill you. Then he pull up to your house with three or four other dudes. That's not all. They rolled up to your crib after midnight. If you Travis at that point, there's only one logical train of thought. If you came to talk, why you need all this backup? Why you banging on my door? Why you ain't show up in the daytime? Why you park down the street and then sneak up to my house? Why'd you bring a gun? Why is it after midnight? I got questions. When they pull up to the house, that's when the story goes crazy. And I condensed Travis's testimony so you can hear it straight from him. So this is Travis's version of what happened that night. I heard these this loud banging, like constant banging, as if someone was like really trying to get your attention. I, I just thought at that moment that the threats were real, so I grabbed my firearm and I headed towards the door. So you grabbed the gun from where? Um, I grabbed it from my bag. Fully loaded? Yes corner I looked up on a monitor I seen it was four guys and I noticed Keyshawn because he has this significant hairstyle which was like a flat top at the time when I went out there I put my firearm near the door which was the couch Take it out with you. Um, I just felt like I could mediate the situation I just feel like it's a time and place for everything and all this was a bit of much of a confusion so literally I walk outside and uh, I was going to approach Keyshawn and I was gonna say 
I said, what's up? But before I even get the up part, the guy with the shirt off with the tattoos, he had sucker punched me in my left eye. And at, him at all? No. That was my first time ever seeing him. Um, he hit me as if he was trying to knock me out. Did he hit Kami or the punch coming? No, he caught me off guard because, like I said, my eyes was directed towards Keyshawn because I was the only person that I recognized at that moment. Um, right after he had punched me, um, it's like all those guys was like in unison and they started like jumping me to basically they're, they're coming from my right. So Tyler hit me from my left and they started jumping me to, from my right to the driveway. So all of them were jumping on you? Yes. You ever experienced anything like this before? No. You wish you had your firearm at that point? Yes. Would have got scared? Yes. Left? Yes. How, how'd you get them off of you, or did you get them off of you? Um, I remember my brother coming in, and he pretty much helped me out a little bit. Um, so, yeah. During that time, my mom, she's like, you guys, please go home. Like, you guys are on camera. Please just go home. Stop, you guys. Yeah, things like that. Did you see any any weapons at this point? Any guns? No, not at this point. How were they fighting with you? Uh, they was they was like trying to hurt us really bad, like trying to kill. Us. I took it as they was trying to kill us. They kicking us, punching us. I got choked one time. Everything. <clears throat> during this uh, during this battle. Yes, they said we on demon time. Y'all gonna die today. That's a threat. Apologize for uh, allegedly slamming your girlfriend. No. Like I said, when I had stepped outside and I said, what's up, before the up part, there was no talking. I got punched, and now I'm getting jumped. Oh, yeah. So they, they came for the smoke. They weren't there to find out your side of the story? No. They didn't care? No, they didn't. What happens? Um, during that time, it was just me, Tyler, and Sebastian, and they were kind of trying to, like, angle me in. And when they was trying to angle me in, t Sebastian was saying, you f with the wrong girl, you finna die today. And then simultaneously when he was saying that, I, I seen Tyler, he pulled out a firearm from his right pocket. Uh, I didn't give him a chance to point it at me. When I seen him pull out his firearm, that's when I went inside to grab my firearm. How about your mom? Did you know where she was at that point? When no, I lost sight. Like I said, during that time, I lost sight of my mom and my brother. So, you know where they were, your mom and brother? No, I knew they was outside, but I just didn't know where they were. That's when I came outside and I slipped, I slipped like you guys seen in the video. And um, I noticed Tyler was near my mom. so. I approached Tyler. Start shooting? No. Did you still showing restraint? Yeah. At that point, if you wanted to? Yes, most definitely. Right in front of you? Yes. Was he attacking your mom? No. He attacking you at that point? No. He attacking your brother at that point? No. There may have been a couple other people in that video frame. Do you know who they were? No. You're more focused on Tyler? Yes, I was more focused on Tyler because that was the guy who I seen pull out the firearm near the palm tree. So. Your brother testified he had a gun pointed at him. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Did you lose sight of your brother during this uh, melee? Yes. All right, so what happens then? Um, I remember Tyler was like, you got that, you got that, you got that. And um, after that... What does that mean to you? Like, don't shoot me? Yes. That's how I took it. Or I don't know, maybe he was trying to throw me off or something. Like, I can't really testify on his behalf, but that's the only thing I could think of. You didn't perceive a threat from him, did you, at that point? No, not at that point. Did you know where his gun was at that point? No, I didn't see a firearm at that point. Pointed it at you, would you have shot him then? Correct. That didn't happen? No. All right, uh, so you didn't receive a threat from Tyler? Correct. You let him go? Right. Where's he go? Um, he started running in the direction, which was south, um, Redwood. He started running towards where it happened to be their car, I guess. Did you know that car was there? No, I didn't know. I didn't know where they parked that. I was confused the whole time when we was fighting, like, how do these people even get here, so. Is there plenty of parking in front of your house? They parked down the street. Yes. Across the street from your house? Yes. So Tyler is running and walking? How's he getting to the car? He's running. You start shooting him as he's running? No. Why not? I mean, he wasn't a threat to me at that moment. When, when he started running, he drew my attention to my brother being down the street. How far away do you think your brother was from you? Um, I would say at least. Why, would he, why did his brother run down the street? Was he getting chased or was he? Maybe he got chased. Maybe he got chased. You see, what do you where is it, what do you actually see when you look down the block too? Um, when I was looking down the block, I seen two men jumping my brother, punching on him, kicking him. I mean, he's defending himself to the best of his ability, but I mean, I'm I'm, I'm afraid for my brother at that point. So you shoot at the guys? No. Why not? 
um, because my brother's in, in that direction as well. So, I mean, like I said, I didn't want to shoot anyone that night. So what do you do when you see your brother? Um, I run down the street. You have no shoes on? No. Socks? Uh, I believe I had socks on, yes. You run fast as you can? Yes. Are you pointing a gun at anyone at this point? No. You take a shot at anyone by the car when you get there? No. Why not? I mean, like I said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think any one of them was a threat at that point. The only time when I thought it was a threat is when I got down there, like where I was basically near my brother. Hold on. So you run to your brother. Where are the two guys that are fighting with him? I'll say I was probably like 40 or 50 feet away. They stopped fighting with my brother and then they go to the car. Um, when I get to my brother. You see um, where the other two guys go who are fighting with your brother? Yes. Where they go? Um, uh, one of them went to the passenger side and then one of them went like behind the driver's seat. The guy fighting with your brother, you know his name? Um, it was Sebastian and Chris Lowe. Sebastian, with the high dreads like your mother described? Right. Where did he go? He went to the passenger seat. In the front or the back? Front. And how about Chris Lowe? He went to the driver back seat. And those are the two guys fighting with your brother? Right. So you get there, does this happen in a split second or are you yes, standing there for 10, 15 seconds yeah. watching this? Yes, Jules, this all happened within a matter of seconds, like literally seconds. You see the guy get in the front passenger seat, you see Chris Lowe gets in behind the driver in the back seat. Right. And do you see this guy without the shirt with the tattoos? Yes. What's he doing? Um, he gets to the car and um, like I said, during this time at- What side of the car does he get? The driver's side. Front or back? Um, back. What does he do? Um, he had the door like half, it was open still, so it's, it was as if he was like using it as a shield or something. And like I said, I couldn't tell if he was Cub. in or out, halfway in, halfway out. And uh, you don't know. I don't know. What do you see? Um, at that time, as soon as I got down there, it appeared that the car was heading towards me, and the and the lights was off. And I seen Sebastian pointing the firearm through the front windshield, and Tyler was pointing the firearm through the door frame of the door, the back door. How far are you and your brother from this car at this point? Uh, I'll say about 10 yards away. You know it's Tyler at that point with a gun? Yes. Where is he pointing the gun? Through the door frame of the back door. Like it was open, so the, I don't know how to really explain it, but if it was the door frame open, yeah. it would be right in the middle of it, type thing. O over the top of the door frame? Yes. Okay. Did you clearly see a gun pointed at you? Most definitely yours, yes. Where was your brother at that point? He was to the right of me, and I believe he was behind me though. How much I'm, behind you do you think? I would say yeah. probably five yards, maybe. Were you focused on your brother? No, I wasn't focused on my brother. I was focused on our lives, though, most definitely. Did you start shooting before you saw Tyler with a gun? No. Did you see anyone else with a gun? Yes, Sebastian. And where was his gun? It was pointing through the front windshield. And where was it pointed at? It was pointing in me and my brother's direction. Did you give him a chance to shoot you? No. You know if either one of them took a shot off? No, I don't know. Not to my knowledge. Why Why did you shoot first? Because, I mean, if, if I wait for them to shoot, that's the that's the matter of seconds, and it could be me and my brother's life just gone like that. Did you feel that your brother's life was in danger of, uh, of being taken away? Most definitely. Not only my brother, mine as well, too. Any doubt about that in your mind? No doubt. Did you want to shoot anyone? No, I didn't. How long did you keep shooting? I kept shooting until I felt like there was no longer a threat. Know exactly how many shots or, or where the shots are going? No. Did you do your best that day? Yes. Did you save your life? Yes. Did you even know anyone got struck? No, I didn't know. You maintain every shot you did was in self-defense? Most definitely. Of you and your brother? Yes, sir. Did you see Tyler run away? Yes. Did you run and chase him and keep shooting at him? No, I did not. Did, did you see what your brother did? Um, yes, my brother, like, ran in the direction that he ran in. Does your brother have a firearm with him? No, he does not. have a firearm? No. Do you know why your brother did that? No, I, I have no clue. Chased. I think he's a lunatic for even doing that, to be honest with you. Did you chase this guy also and say you're going to finish him off and start shooting at him as he's running? No, not at all. So after, after the shots, we see you on the video. Remember that video? Correct. Why, why'd you go down the block? Well, because I had... I seen my brother run in that direction, so I was worried about his safety as well as just making sure that those other guys wasn't coming back. 
what what'd you do then? I mean, what what'd you do? Or what'd you see when you went down? The block? Uh, when I seen what I seen was when I was going down the block, I saw that my brother was following him in his direction, Tyler in his direction, and I seen Tyler jump the gate. So I told my brother, "Come back, he's gone now." You actually saw Tyler jump the gate? Yes. Shoot at him? No. Yeah. Because he wasn't a threat to me at that moment. Still showing some restraint. You're not hiding it? No, I did not. Because I did everything in self-defense. I had every right to do what I did. I saved me and my brother's life. And were you emotional during this time, or were you just talking like this? No, I, I was definitely emotional. I was shooken up. Like, I mean, if you ever go through that type of experience, it's not a good feeling. Like, just knowing that, like, you've just seen your life flash before your eyes. So, I was definitely emotional. Were you in shock? Most definitely. Crying? Yes, I was crying. Did you ever go through anything like this other than, you know, what happened to your dad, but did you personally ever go through anything like this? No, never. Travis ended up shooting his gun 39 times and he hit two of the guys that was in the car. One of the guys he hit would later pass away. And that's why Travis was ultimately charged with murder. So a bunch of actual murderers down in the state of Florida have gotten off completely clean thanks to the stand your ground law. But in this case, it wasn't applicable because the guys had gotten back into their car and the police believed that they was fleeing the scene. But Travis says they drove right back in his direction and they was pointing guns out their car at him and his brother and the best cover he had was to lay down cover fire which he did and he believes he saved him and his brother's life murder begins when self-defense ends now that was a simple sentence said many many years ago but that simple sentence perfectly encapsulates why this defendant right there Travis Rudolph is sitting in the chair that he's sitting in if you attack me at my home, I don't think it's fair that you get to decide when the interaction turns hostile. And then on top of that, you get to choose exactly when the hostility stops. So if you come to my house with violence, I'm at your mercy. And I basically got to play the whole thing by your rules. So you can just attack me until I'm either dead or I turn the tables on you and get the upper hand. You brought conflict to my home that you was ready for. You prepared for, you premeditated this. I was at home chilling, now I gotta switch to defense mode. All because you decided to come to my property. But me, as a regular citizen, I'm supposed to be able to read this situation so damn perfectly. I'm supposed to know the exact moment when the dudes that came to my house are no longer a threat. Bro, the police can't even do that. They fear for their life and make mistakes every day it happens all the time and that's okay because they're human but a regular citizen who's not trained for this this man ain't had no vest he ain't even had no shoes on he's supposed to be able to handle this situation and do everything perfectly by the book i think that's dumb and fortunately, the jury did agree. And last week, Travis Rudolph was acquitted of all charges. Do I think he handled every single step of that flawlessly? No, but trained professionals mess this up every day. He clearly had multiple chances to do a lot more damage. And he let the last guy go. He could have easily got him. If Dominique was a child, then I would feel bad for her. But as a grown woman, man, the fact is she incited this whole thing. I know that she was upset and yeah, breakups are tough. But you literally told your brother to go shoot his shit up. And listen, man, like you always hate when someone loses their life. But if you threaten someone else's, and I don't mean a verbal threat. I mean, you actually attack and become a real threat to somebody's life and to their family. In my moral conscience, and again, I'm just speaking for me, they got every single right to protect their life and protect their family. In the past six years, Travis Rudolph lost his dad, went undrafted, made an NFL team, even caught a few passes, got cut and picked up by another team and got injured and cut again, rehabbed the injury, went to the CFL and got released because of this incident. Now for the last two years, dude's been fighting for his freedom after he was the one who was attacked in his own damn home. And finally, he gets another win as he's acquitted of all the charges that were brought against him and hopefully he can move on with his life. He's gonna have to deal with some trauma 
trauma because every time somebody knock on the door, especially late at night, you know where the first place his mind's going to go. So he's going to have to go through that and try to get on another roster. Maybe the XFL or the USFL would give him a shot in one of those leagues. But either way, man, hopefully these next six years are a hell of a lot better than his last six, all right? Hard to imagine it being worse, but do not tempt fate. Just keep praying, keep moving, and just be grateful for your freedom. Do you think the jurors actually made the right decision? Or do you disagree with the verdict? Man, feel free to voice your opinions down in the comment sections, but keep that shit respectful no matter what side you fall on. But that's all I got for this one, man. Hope y'all enjoyed the video. And if you want to watch another one, click right here on the screen.